Coming up on episode 298 of Wheel Bearings, we've got the all-new Ford Ranger, the Ford Bronco, the uh, new GMC Canyon, more on the Cadillac Lyric, a new sports car from Honda, and a very, very bad new EV from Vietnam. All that and more coming up next. <laughs> This is episode 298 of Wheel Bearings. I am Sam of Wall Sandwich from Guidehouse Insights. And I am Nicole Wakeman from True Car. And Robbie is uh, not with us this morning because he had a little family emergency he had to deal with. So uh, best of uh, best wishes to Robbie. Hope everything's okay there. Um, and um, let's uh, let's go get started. Okay. Um, what uh, what have you been driving? Well, I had some fun stuff to drive this week. So right now in my driveway is the Toyota RAV4. So I have just like the, I don't know, is it kind of the go-to crossover for people? I mean, this thing sells. I think it's the best selling right now. Yeah. I know. Wasn't it, wasn't it tied for with the um, CRV at one point or weren't they, weren't they duking it out? Yeah. It's, I think last I checked, it was a little bit ahead. um, And, you know, it had overtaken the Camry as the best selling non-truck. So, you know, the best selling nameplates in the US are the F150, the GM trucks and the Ram uh, 1500 and then after that you have the everything else and the RAV4 for the last couple of years has been the top seller. So, it's kind of a big deal. It's a little bit of a big deal. Yeah. Would say it's a big deal. So, they made a couple of changes. It's no like big re- redone all new I don't even think it's refresh. It's just sort of like typical. There have been some changes this year, I think, as I would describe this one. We've got the handy dandy. Just the usual model year to model year updates. Uh, Usual, like we adjusted a few things to make it better, but nothing to knock your socks off. So um, you can get this with a gas, a hybrid, or a plug-in hybrid, which they call the Prime, just like they have the Prius Prime. Mm Um, I just had the gas, so I have the the tr- traditional. Is that a traditional engine now? It's a just, gas. Yeah, engine. internal combustion. Oh, internal crazy. combustion engine. Um, so it's a two point five liter four cylinder. It has two hundred three horsepower, one hundred eighty four pound feet of torque. Uh, it's an eight speed automatic transmission. Uh, there's all wheel drive. This trim is priced at thirty three seven seventy. That's what I have for my base price on this one. Um, but there's a couple little extra bits and pieces that they've added on. Um, there's the larger touch screen on this one, a fancy audio system, and it has the adventure grade convenience package, which is a couple little, ex- again, little tiny features to make it a little bit better. So my total all in with destination that I'm going to make you guess price is $39,894. So just comes under 40, Sam. What do you think the destination is all on you? I mean, you win. I'm- uh, well, in that case, it's got to be $1. <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll guess I'll guess 995 bucks. No, it's surprisingly a good chunk higher. $1,330, oh. Oh, wow. which I was surprised how high that was. I guess I'm, I'm not as surprised as I would have been a couple of years ago. I mean, yeah. everybody's been jacking up their delivery charges. This is true. So it's not like it's, you know, so, but all net, 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 all done. You're going to get this for under 40 grand. So it's not cheap but it's a decent price because you're getting one that has a lot of features it's nice the interior it's it's still it's a toyota they have nice interiors even in the fancier trims they're never something that you look at and you think like wow this is an upscale it's not it's not supposed to be a luxury brand you want that go find a lexus you know so it's but it still has a nice interior i think toyota does a good job of still providing something that is comfortable and like appealing when you open the door, even though you don't have super fancy, expensive materials. Um, it's roomy inside. They're seating. Like I said, I think I said for five front row passengers, doesn't matter how big you are. Even Robbie, I think is going to be able to get comfortable in the front row of a RAV4. Um, if you're in the back seat, again, it's still pretty roomy. It's, it's a crossover, you know, it's not huge or a compact SUV, however you want to look at it. Um, but there's still a decent amount of headroom and leg room. And it's not one of those that slopes down so aggressively in the back that if you're tall, you're going to feel like your head's headroom's kind of compromised. Cause some uh-huh. of them look, they look really super sleek on the outside. And then you put anybody over five feet in the back and they're kind of doing this hunched thing. Uh, this one still has good room. It seats three in the back, but I think with just about every cr- compact crossover, it seats three. You don't want to do that. You really just want to put no. stuff. There. like you can put three too, it's too narrow for for well three kids you could do it yeah for three adults un, unless they're you know fairly slim shouldered 
they're not going to be very comfortable for any length of time. That's it. Like three women might be able to sit back there. Three men with men, you know, men at broader shoulders, generally speaking, you're going to be squished back there. So it's for two people in the back. Um, it's nice to drive. I mean, it has a good amount of power. It's not going to win races. It's not super aggressive, but it's also not dull. It's enough power that it's engaging. You can accelerate fairly easily. The only time you can, if you really mash the gas, like if you're trying to, oh God, I'm about to miss my exit. I may have done that. Slam the gas on and try to get over. It's like, no, no, I choose not to go. It just, it just has a very slow response. And then once it realizes like, oh wait, she's in a rush. Then suddenly it will give you that power. But in that heartbeat, you're like, you are not helping me make the exit I'm about to miss and get in front of these cars to merge over. So it's, it's fine acceleration, just typical getting up to highway speed, driving around town. But if you need that boost to power, it's a little bit lacking. Um, the things they added this year, um, there is a larger standard touchscreen. It was seven inches. Now it's eight, but I had a larger touchscreen in this one. And I've just blanked on the size because it's optional. You can get a lot. Oh, it's a 10.5 inch screen. Um, that comes along with a little package. It was like a $1,400 package. It also adds in JBL audio. So it's, it's an extra, otherwise you're going to get an eight inch touchscreen. Uh, you got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android auto that connects pretty well. Um, sometimes I find, Sam, do you ever find this, the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android auto? Sometimes it feels like it takes, like when you're trying to pair it or when you sit back down in the car, it's, it doesn't. Yeah. A lot of times when you first, when you get in the car, you know, with, when you're doing wired, you get in the car, you plug your phone in, start the car, and it's there. As soon as the screen boots up, you're you're there. But with wireless on a lot of vehicles, I find that it takes as much as a minute yeah. for it to to re to find it, reconnect, and and get everything going. And so, you know, especially you know if you're if you're going if you need to go somewhere and you know you need your nav, you know if you if you're look if you need your directions, you know it's like okay, you're sitting there waiting for it to catch up which is why most of the time I just plug in my phone. I do the same thing because even though I like wireless, cause you don't have the cord, mm -hmm. you know, not a little mess on your center console when you're trying to plug things in. I hate that delay. And it's weird. It, a minute doesn't seem like a lot until you're sitting and you've just hopped in the car someplace like at a valet stand or something where there's traffic or you're trying to get out of a parking garage. Like when you're in a rush, a minute is a really long time. You feel like everyone behind you is like, come on, move. And you think, I don't know which way to go. I don't have any navigation. So that's when it's frustrating. Um, so I love wireless, but I also hate it for that exact reason. Um, they have digital instrument clusters now on this, like it's a standard digital instrument cluster, which I think is kind of neat because I think as more and more cars have digital instrument clusters, when I get one without one, suddenly I feel like I'm like rocking 1985. Like <laughs> it just feels really, do you think that like that now when you see them that they don't? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So they sort of feel like weirdly outdated when they don't have a digital instrument cluster. So I like that. Um, it gets good fuel economy. It, it's supposed to get the official on the Monroney I'm holding is 25 city, 33 highway, 28 combined. And I happened to drive this um, to go drive the, uh, the Kia Seltos this year, which was they did the drive program in Newport, Rhode Island. So I just oh. drove to it. Yeah. Which is mostly highway driving and it's about an hour and 45 minutes. And I think my, what was it about? Like it was fluctuating back and forth. I was, I was around 26 miles per gallon, which is good because you think, well, highways. Yeah. But right when you get into Newport, is not highways. So you have a lot of twisty, turny streets, stop and go kind of congested traffic. And I hit a little rush hour traffic on the way back, which also didn't help my fuel economy at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was fine to drive for that. It held a good amount of cargo. It's easy to get around in a little city. I mean, when you're in a little city, you don't know where you're going. Having a big car as you're trying to suddenly change lanes is a problem. It was nice to have something that was small enough to zip, 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 zip back and forth as I was trying to follow directions to get out of downtown Newport. Um, so I liked it. The, my only, my only like real negative was that if you really want a lot of power, if you need to accelerate really fast and you're already at highway speed, it takes a second to respond. Yep. Yeah. That, the, you know, a lot, you know, naturally aspirated engines like that 2.5 liter Toyota, um, you know, they, they generally don't have a lot of low end torque. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get them up, you know, into that three, 4,000 RPM range before they really start to pull. And <clears throat> Uh, the that one doesn't have a CVT, right? It's a eight speed. No, it's an eight speed. Yeah, this yeah. 
double checking. It's an eight speed automatic on this one. So it's not a CVT. Although you do get a heck of a lot of noise when you're like, like yeah. you still hear it. It's not the CVT wine, but you hear everything working really, really hard. Did Did you try it in sport mode? I did. I tried it and I don't find, I didn't find significant differences. Did you? Um, it's, been a while since i drove a regular rav4 uh but yeah it was it was not it didn't make it didn't seem to make a particular difference in the past yeah so uh yeah i mean i'm you know i think for the most part it's you know it's adequate the performance is adequate it's not you know it's not, it's not gonna get your adrenaline pumping but uh yeah but i feel like that's not what this car is for this is no I mean, you got to give a car credit for doing what it's supposed to do. This is not supposed to be a performance car. It's not supposed to be fast. It's supposed to be a, like a small, efficient crossover. Daily commuter, right? Uh, you know, hauling the kids around. You right. Know, so like just you only want, have a couple of kids. If you yeah. want power. Well, okay, you're going to have to get something far more expensive and far less fuel efficient. There's a trade off. So yeah. this does what it's supposed to do quite well. And I think there you can get. Can you get the the Rav Four now with the two point four liter turbo as an option? I, I think I think they do because they used to have they used to offer a V six. I think I can double check. Or did they? Believe, um, no, I think it's just with a, as I'm looking now. Okay, just the two liter four cylinder. That's it. That's your only option. And then you have the the prime. that or the the hybrids and the plug in hybrids. Right, so if you want the if you want a performance Rav Four, you got to get the Prime. Exactly. That's like 300 horsepower and all the electric low end torque. Right. Um, you know, it's al- almost like driving an EV. And that thing, you know, the the prime. If if you can swing the price, you know, it starts at forty thousand dollars. And if you can find one, which is actually the bigger issue, that really is the trick with all of this, right? Like, you know, yeah, exactly the car I want. Mm, we don't have that. If you, if you can if you can find a Rav Four Prime, you know, you got forty miles of electric range, yep. and uh, you know, and and more performance than the gas or the regular hybrid. Um, and so that one would be the one to get if you actually want performance in a Rav Four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you had something else too, right? I did. I also had, and this was for um a loan, and I I'm kind of surprised this is one they sort of worked directly to get. I had a Rivian R1S. Um, I have not had a chance to drive a Rivian before, or other than like 35 seconds. Uh, so it was nice to actually have some real time with one. First of all, if you want to have a car, uh, then this is the R1S is the SUV. So it's big. Um, it also has that really distinctive sort of oval shaped lights on the mm-hmm. front. So you are not subtle driving this. Everybody will look at you and go, what? Like, because you just don't, I think even if you're in California, this is not the the car that you're going to see all the time. It's less common and it looks so funky, but like in a good way, I think it looks neat. I like I like that it looks different. Yeah, they've, they've they've given it a distinctive face that doesn't look quite like anything else. I mean, you know, when you look at it in profile, yeah, it's a pretty standard SUV shape. Yeah, it's very but funny. from from the front, when you see that face, you see those headlights. And you know, oh, okay, that's a Rivian. Right? You know, it's you know, Jeep has their seven slot grill. You know, and but Rivian's got those lights. I feel like a lot of them are trying to make more distinctive like front ends, either through the lights or the th- through the grill. And the lights are the easiest way to do it because even mm-hmm. at night you see the lights. You have no idea what the grill looks like at night, but the lights, those stand out. Like the one I can always recognize behind me is a Volvo because they have those Thor's hammer headlights. Yep. You tell a Volvo when it's behind you because it always has those headlights, even if it's nighttime, you can see that. So I feel like these, the Rivian, you're like, yep, that's a Rivian. Like there's no way you can mistake this for anything else. So this is a luxury electric SUV. It starts at $78,000. It's not cheap. It's not cheap. This is not the everyman's SUV. Um, but it's really, it feels like that price. Like I always say when you, when you have a luxury car or a high price, even if it's not really truly a luxury vehicle, you still want it to feel like the price it is. I don't want to spend 78 grand and feel like I could get the same thing for 50. Like I want it to look like it costs a little bit more than what everybody else's car looked like. And this does. The inside is just absolutely beautiful. It has these rich leather seats and there's these bright orange accents. And even like on the back, the pockets on the back of the front seats have like a little buckly kind of thing, like a little metal accent. It does absolutely nothing other than look cool. You know, it's mm-hmm. just like a little premium detail. And on the backs of the headrest, there's a little hook. So you could hang 
like your coat, or I guess if your ladies could hang your purse or whatever bag you wanted to hang there. These are little things. They're not super important. They don't change how your car drives, but they make it feel special. Yeah. Well, and you know, when you're going to, if you're going to pay that much for a vehicle, you, you want those details. You want, you want that stuff that's been, that they thought that somebody thought took some time to think about and how to implement it. Um, and of course, you know, that those details do add a significant amount to the cost. You know, it's not, it's not a, a trivial cost to add those things, which is why it's expensive. Right. And it doesn't seem like, well, it's just a buckle. Well, yeah, but instead of just making one flat thing, they've got to have the buckles and have them attached and have that. So like it, all these little bits and pieces add to the cost of the vehicle, but I feel like they do it in a good way in this. Um, it's got really impressive power figures. Um, there's different setups you can get. You, they all have all wheel drive, but there's like a dual motor, there's a dual motor performance, and then there's a quad motor. So you get three different flavors of Rivian with varying powers. Power. Except that that quad motor is actually the only one you can get right now. The Correct. others are coming soon. Coming soon. So, so with the quad motor, what you get is 835 horsepower. They say 908 pound feet of torque and a zero to 60 time of three seconds for this behemoth of an SUV. Three seconds. It moves. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing though, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it, I mean, it's big, but it's not, it's not, I wouldn't call it a behemoth. You know, if you've driven the, the Hummer, it's, oh, well, that's it's, it's rather compact well, by comparison. Everything, everything is small compared to a Hummer. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like a, a super duty truck is small compared yeah. to Hummer. I mean, this, you know, yeah. this is this is basically the same size as a Grand Cherokee L. Yes. It's, it's so it's a, long. It's very long. Yeah. Like, look at that profile. It's very long. Like I was looking at it. It's sitting in my driveway. And I looked outside my driveway a few minutes ago. And just looking at that roof, I'm like, man, that is a long roof when you're looking down on it. So it is it is big. But the thing is, it's like that kind of three. What did I just say? Three seconds. That's yeah. For a, for a large-ish SUV. Um, so you definitely have all the power you could possibly want. Like it's not lacking in power. You want to accelerate, it's going to accelerate. You mash on that pedal, you're going to move. Even if you're already at speed, you have no trouble getting more speed compared to the RAV4 it is slightly more responsive. Um, just, a, just a tad. Just a, a skosh. <laughs> um, and so you get, again, there's varying miles of range. And I think the highest range that you can get this with which is with the large battery pack and the quad motor, which is what we have. It's 321 miles per charge, uh, which again is way more than enough than anyone's ever going to need during a typical day. And for the two of you who are like, I don't know, I drive 322 miles where you are not the average person. Like most people <laughs> are going to be fine with 321 miles uh, so that it, it's easy to live with every day. What takes a little bit of getting used to is there's a 16 inch touchscreen that controls all the things, everything. If you want to control something other than turn the wheel, <laughs> it's in that touchscreen, which is good and bad. Like I like, you know, I'm a touchscreen fan. I hate the Mazda fiddly controller, but there's balance between what I want to have a knob for and what I don't. And one of the things that struck me and, and this just, it drove me crazy. So the air vents, you can see them. You can't physically move them. You cannot take your finger and slide the vent and move it from one side to the other. You're like, big deal, whatever. You have to go into the infotainment system and you have you can select each vent and you can like tap it off and on individually each vent. Then you can like, woo, like slide your finger around and aim that air at any direction you want, which sounds great. And it looks cool. And you feel like, ah, the future is Star Trek. Everything's an infotainment touch screen. But that's not easy to use when you're driving. And everyone said, well, how often do you change the vents when you're driving? I change them a lot. Like the sun suddenly comes through your side of the car and it's beaming you in the face. You're going to want that AC vent pointing right at you, mm -hmm. even though the rest of your passengers might be not in the sun and don't want it. Or like on a really, the flip side, it's winter, it's freezing cold. You have the moment when you sit down and it's 10 degrees, you want all the heat directly on you. But then you kind of want to push those vents a little bit out of the way as the car warms up. Or, you know, you, you're, you're going transitioning from your defog of the windows to the, the heat. Uh, you know, you've got to re redirect that stuff. You know, when you get first get in the car on that cold morning, you want your defoggers on. And then sometimes, you know, as you're driving along, you need to go back and forth. You know, if you if you go to heat, turn off the defog and go to heat, you know, mm -hmm. your windows start to fog up after a while. You got to switch back and forth. Doing that through a touchscreen interface is a terrible design. 
It's horrible. I mean, it like when you're just sitting there and you look at it, you first start playing with it. You think it's the neatest thing ever. And the second you realize you have to move those vents like that when you're driving, you're like, this is the worst idea ever. You just need, and I literally was playing with vents. I'm like, nope, I, am I missing this? I'm like, no, nope, nope. I'm going to break this vent that probably costs $5,000. Nope. I'm going to leave it right there because you can see them. Mm-hmm. You can grab the little louvers, but you can't move them. I mean, you could, you'll probably break it. You've broken some motor in there. I did chose not to do that, to not make the Rivian people unhappy with me. But so that was, so it's that weird balance. I feel like that, that automakers haven't figured out in the tech. There's a lot of stuff that works well on the infotainment screen. There's a lot of stuff that we really just need to be able to do the old fashioned way. Not everything needs to be technology focused. Sometimes just a louver, you can slide back and forth. That's all you need. Just a little louver. That's it. A knob you can twist to adjust the fan speed. You That's know. all you need, right? I don't need all Gra- this. Granted, some of the some of the voice control stuff works pretty well. Like if you want, if you if you just want to adjust the temperature, you know, you can say Alexa, you know, set the temperature to seventy two or sixty five or whatever whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and and they use uh, Rivian uses Alexa voice services for the voice control, which is kind of. I mean, in my experience, at least, it was kind of hit and miss. It works well sometimes. Navigation, it has trouble with, though. Yeah, I found like asking it to do things, it was like, well, let's see what it's going to do today. Like it was, like you said, hit or miss. Um, Still my favorite voice anything is the system in Toyota and Lexus right now. I feel like their new system, I don't know if it just likes the timber of my voice, but it always hears me. It always responds. It always does what I ask. It's the only one. I don't know. I sometimes think they like certain voices, certain enunciation. I must say things right for it's, their it's, it's worked well for me in everything except the lexus rx yeah that which, one it, it hated you yes it absolutely it refused to recognize that i was asking it to do anything where you were just unknown it was like you're dead to me it's like whatever yeah. you, what you did to take off that car sam but no it was having none of it <laughs> yeah uh, no so the rivian so the rivian is a, is a great experience one of the like and it has some neat little um sort of fun features. So there's a key, the key fob that actually unhooks and can be a carabiner. Mm-hmm. So you can clip it to something totally unnecessary, but a nice feature. Then you have a key card that you can also use your phone. We have a key card, looks like a little credit card. If you want to slide that and you even have like a little tiny little wristlet, like a little rubber wristlet that's waterproof that you can use that. So if you were going swimming or something and you don't want to have to bring anything with you, you could just bring this. You can lock everything else in the truck lock and all this stuff in the truck. And yeah. yeah. So it, like nice little features. Again, it goes to that whole luxury pricing, luxury features. These are not huge things, but they do make your life a little bit easier. And I feel like that's a lot of what a luxury vehicle should do. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in it. I think the thing that might be the deal breaker for me on it, like, okay, Nicole, you got $70,000 to burn. Is this going to be it? That touchscreen, the touchscreen controls are a little too much for me. I can, I can see that. I, I felt, I felt exactly the same way. Did that you? is to me, the, the single biggest flaw with both this and the R1T mm-hmm. is having, and you know, to be fair, they are, Rivian's not the only one that does this. You oh, know, correct. Te- te- Tesla pioneered this and mm-hmm. they, they basically did follow the same template as Tesla. Um, you know, so they have, every, you know, Tesla, you know, with the Model 3 and the Model Y in particular, they have everything in the touchscreen. And, you know, on the steering wheel, you've got a couple of rollers, roller and rocker switches on the spokes that are unlabeled uh, yeah. because what they do depends on the mode that you're in. <laughs> it, it varies. And that's also, I find, I find that confusing. The only thing I can think, Sam, is after you've driven, like we have the car for a week, right? Yeah. Or this drive, we have it for a day. If I have this car every day, all week, you know, for a month or two or three months, would it suddenly become very intuitive? I'm going to think it might, you know, like you start to learn where things are in your car and you don't really think about it anymore. So I'm thinking it's just, there's a certain learning curve that takes some time. I'd rather not have that learning curve to adjust things. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think for the, the steering wheel controls, I think that's true. I think, you know, for the stuff that's in the touchscreen, you know, you will, have a better idea you'll you'll learn where the stuff is in the menus but you still have to look at the screen to actually control it exactly yeah. and that's a problem that's a challenge if you still have to look at the screen you know the whole thing point is to, to not take your eyes off the road for too long and they're doing everything they can even with screen positioning and things to keep your eyes as close to the road when you do have to shift down to look at the screen this 
takes your eyes off the road and it really takes them off the road. You know? Yep. Hey, wheel bearings listeners. It's Sam. And as I'm recording this, we're getting ready to head out tomorrow for a vacation trip in Hawaii. And one of the great things about going to Hawaii is all the fresh fish and the Asian inspired food. We just love it there. We love, love eating the food there. And when we get back, we still love to eat that same kind of food, the Pacific foods of the Pacific islands. And this May, HelloFresh is helping by celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So for a limited time only, you can get some of that same kind of food with limited time authentic recipes created in partnership with Chef Serbi Sani of New York's Tagmo Restaurant. Uh, who's creating a special cultural taste tour right in your own kitchen. After uh, May is over, as we get into the summer months, you're probably going to be having friends over for uh, for parties and everything. Uh, so if you're hosting a get-together, check out HelloFresh Market for crowd-pleasing appetizers, snacks, sides, and more for your next gathering. It'll save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle putting, putting everything together as you get your friends together in the backyard. The best part, you can skip that extra trip to the grocery store. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com slash WheelBearings16, that's WheelBearings16, and use the coupon code wheel bearings one six for 16 free meals plus free shipping remember go to hellofresh.com slash wheel bearings 16 and use the coupon code wheel bearings 16 that's wheel bearings one six for 16 free meals with free shipping hellofresh is america's number one meal kit so if you haven't tried it yet now's the perfect opportunity for to get 16 free meals did you know you can support wheel bearings directly Head to patreon.com slash wheelbearingsmedia and you can become a patron today. Your contributions will help fund the platforms and tools we use to bring the podcast to you. And exclusives and improvements are already on the way thanks to your generosity. So if you want to be part of an automotive podcast like no other, head to patreon.com slash wheelbearingsmedia. All right. Well, um, I had uh, a late change of plans in my drive schedule this week i was supposed to have a mach e so that i could try out the new blue cruise 1.2 um but um day before i got a note from ford saying yeah we need the mach e for something else um and we'll get you rescheduled in that so they sent me a ford bronco heritage edition Ooh, which one heritage those are all the fancy colors right um that's yeah the one i've got is race red with white so the heritage the Heritage Edition is a trim level they launched for the 2023 models um, that basically has some color combinations that are kind of a throwback to old school, late 60s, early 70s Broncos. So, you know, it already had the design cues of, of those old Broncos, but now you've got kind of that early 70s color cues. So this one has the, the body is in race red with um, a white stripe down the side, down, down each side, white top and white wheels and the wheels um they're similar to the ones that you can get on the bronco sport that um they're they're alloy wheels cast alloy wheels but they have you know these slots in them so they they actually look like steel wheels cool so you know it looks like you know 70 you know in, if you look at go go back and look at photos of a lot of you know early suvs and vans and stuff from the 70s um, you know, they often had these white painted steel wheels. And so these look like steelies, I but they're actually that. cast alloy. Yep. I think um, I love the look of steelies. I think that's yeah. neat. And, and then there's also the white grill and then the red Ford, um, word Ford in the grill. Uh, so it looks, it looks pretty cool. It's, it's a cool looking truck. Yeah. Um, the heritage edition comes standard with the Sasquatch package, um, which means you get, you know, the good off-road stuff. Um, you get the 35 inch wheels, so 35 inch tires, uh, mud terrain tires, um, with, with the white, uh, the white wheels. And it's a, it's a pretty cool, pretty, pretty fun look to it. Um, I, I like the design. Um, the one I have is the two door. You can get it as a four door as well. Um, and it's a 2.3 liter four cylinder EcoBoost mm -hmm. with a manual transmission. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a going to be kind of a rarity. I think, you know, the number of these that are going to be built in this combination is probably going to be pretty small. I think most people are going to go for the 10 speed automatic. This is a seven speed manual, which is really actually a six speed 
um, because the one ratio is a crawl ratio. It's for when oh. you're off-roading. That's so call it a seven speed. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's got seven speeds. It's just, there's only six that you're ever going to use on the road. You're, oh. you're, <laughs> you're not going to want to use the crawl ratio on the road, you know, unless you want to be driving along at 10 miles an hour at 5,000 RPM. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a crawler. Um, but you know, that's what this thing is designed for, you know, put the Sasquatch package on there and everything, you know, this is designed for going off road. Um, it's got, you know, the one I have, uh, the, the top it's the hard top, the modular hard top. So comes off in a bunch, you know, like I think seven different pieces. So you got four roof top panels that you can take off individually over each of the seats. Um, and then the two rear quarter panels the quarter windows um and then the um the rear glass the rear uh, i think can also come off mm-hmm. um and then the the spare is mounted on the um on the uh, tailgate which swings open sideways as it does on all broncos and you can take the doors off and, and all that stuff I, I haven't bothered to do any of that this time I've, I've done that in the past um the uh with the four-cylinder engine you know it's 275 horsepower um you know this is, you know, it's not a lightweight vehicle, but it's not ridiculously heavy either. Yeah. You know, it in the two door, um, four cylinder manual is about forty three hundred pounds. So it's, you know, it's chunky, but it's not, it's not absurd. Uh, you know, it's like less than half of the weight of a of a Hummer EV. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, with those big tires on there, uh, and the gearing, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's accelerating excessively rapidly <laughs> uh yeah like not slow not accelerating yeah. excessively rapidly okay <laughs> you know it, it's, let's just say this is this is not a mustang and it, it's not a bronco raptor you know the, the raptors you know quite a bit quicker yeah. um and but you can you can also get this you know the heritage as with all other broncos with the 2.7 liter uh v6 which is about uh, 315 horsepower and a fair bit more torque than the four cylinder but you can't get the V6 with the manual. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's adequate um, for, for performance. Um, and it's got enough performance for, for off-roading as well. You know, it's got enough torque there for off-roading. Um, so if you want, you know, if you like the idea of, you know, manual transmission, when you're crawling over boulders and stuff like that, you know, this has got you covered. And, you know, the two door, you know, if you're going to do rock crawling, um, you know, is probably the one to have because the shorter wheelbase, you know, you've got on all of them, you've got fairly short overhangs. So you got good approach and departure angles. Um, but the, oh, with the two door, you got the shorter wheelbase. So you got more of a breakover angle as well, which is going to make it a lot easier when you're going over the, the really rough stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got good ground clearance. There's plenty, plenty of ground clearance. Um, there's fixed running boards on here, but they're like tucked right up to the body. So they're, they're not hanging down. So, Climbing in and out because of the 35 inch tires, you know, it's, it's fair. It's a bit of a climb <laughs> up into this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and you know, because the, the, the rock or the, the running, the, um, uh, the running boards don't extend down from the body. You know, you still got a, it's a pretty good step up to get up into it. Yeah. The back seat, um, you know, is snug for a couple of people. It's, you know, comparable to what you get in a Wrangler. Um, you know, so it's not, you know, it, it'll, it can take a couple of people, but you know, you, you're not going to want to do a long distance road trip in this, in this thing with people in the back and, you know, the cargo space behind the back seat is also relatively limited. Um, but you know, it's, uh, if, if what you're, if what you need is space for carrying more people on a regular basis, and more cargo space, then what you probably want is the four door anyway. Right. Because it's not easy to get in. I mean, yeah. In the back, but it's it's like it's a little bit of a you gotta be a little flexible, a little, little like bit that. of contortion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know the the Broncos start at about thirty four or thirty five thousand dollars. You know, for a base four cylinder manual transmission Bronco without without anything on it. Mm-hmm. Um, this one um, came in at uh, let's see forty nine thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. Um, you want to guess on the, uh, I'm going to go with, I'm always wrong. I'm going to go with nine ninety five. Seventeen ninety five. Oh God. I was way too low. Yeah. 1795. Yeah. 
Yep. Wow. Big, big uh, delivery charges on these. Um, one, one other detail uh, about the, the heritage edition, in addition to the white trim on the outside, you also have a white trim panel on across the dashboard, Okay. Um, which again, looks pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's different, you know, it's not what you typically find on most vehicles. And okay. then it's got Bronco in red across the passenger side. Um, you know, for that $50,000, you know, that's with the base, um, sync four system on there. So that's like an eight inch screen. So it's by modern standards, that's a relatively small screen in there. Uh, it does have, uh, Android auto and CarPlay, uh, both wireless, uh, capable, um, you know, and like the, uh, the RAV4, if you're using it wirelessly, it, it takes, you know, when you start the, the vehicle, it takes mm, probably more like about 30 seconds to yeah. get going. It's not quite as bad as the, as the Toyota. Um, but it, you know, it still takes a while. If you plug it in and it just, you know, comes up immediately. You think they're going to figure out that, that out, Sam, Sam, put on your engineering hat for a second. How hard of an issue is that to overcome so that the wireless it, doesn't have that delay? I, I have had some cars, like uh, some GM vehicles, where it comes up almost immediately. Okay, there you so, go. So, you know, it can be done, um, but, it you know, it does – wireless is always tough, you know, especially, you know, when you've got changing conditions, you know, especially if you've got multiple people using the vehicle and you've got maybe multiple phones that are paired to it, you know, trying to figure out which one to use – um, you know, that it, thing, things can get a little, a little hairy there. Um, the, the one I, the, the Bronco I have also has the auxiliary switch package, which goes up on the, the roof by the, by the mirror. So you've got six pre-wired switches for, you know, if you want to put a winch on there or exterior lights and other stuff, um, you know, you've got a lot of, a lot of, you can, uh, it's all pre-wired and I think there's a, there's a connector under the hood where you can hook all that stuff up. So you don't have to run the wires and the switches. Um, the, uh, uh, I did the, I did, uh, get download the uh, trail package, which was actually, uh, just, uh, released last week, the trail app. Okay. Um, so this is something that, uh, Ford has worked with somebody on. So you can, um, it's got trail maps. Uh, so if you're going to go off-roading, um, then, uh, you can use this, to uh and it's supported in carplay and android auto as well um uh yeah to go off-roading uh and then you can put your phone you can shot yeah uh i didn't i didn't have a chance i didn't have time to to take it to an orv park um my favorite rv park was closed this weekend so i didn't have a chance to go up there um but um I, i getting it all paired up is a little bit of a challenge when i first tried it um with car when i tried it uh, i tried it with um with an android phone um and when i tried to log into the the trail app it would not go to the login screen it kept crashing um and uh then i tried it with an iphone and i could get logged into the trail app on the phone uh, but when it tried to connect to the 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 bronco it kept saying you know incompatible vehicle um, and so I sent a note to, uh, to our friend, Mike over at Ford and, <laughs> and said, Hey, you know, I'm having some issues with this, you know, and I explained, you know, what, and I, I did a little screen recording on my, on my pixel to, you know, show him what was happening, how it was crashing. Um, and, um, then the next day he got back to me, uh, and said, try, okay, try it again now. And I guess he passed the information along to the, the engineering guys. And, uh, apparently they fixed something on the server side that corrected it. Okay. Um, so, so then it works. And what you can do with that is you have, like I say, you have trail maps on there. Uh, I think for free you get, um, I can't remember. I think it's like 700 trail maps. Uh, and then you can get a subscription to get a couple of thousand trail maps. Um, and you, if you mount your phone, um, on a bracket on the, on the windshield, you can use the camera on the phone to record as you're, as you're driving. So it, it records all that stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. If you're actually going to do some off-roading with a Bronco, I would definitely recommend that you get the, the trails app, uh, the Bronco trails app, the app is free. And like I said, the, the free version, um, gets you several hundred, uh, trails that you can use. And so it'll, you can put in, you know, put in 
your location um, and then it'll show you where there's ORV parks available near you or trails available near you and then bring it up in the navigation. So uh, it all, it all works pretty well. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Um, fuel efficiency actually was not as bad as I expected. No. Um, you know, I've, I've done mostly a bunch of highway driving because I had a couple of trips to Detroit and a trip to Royal Oak this week. And it's averaged um, just about 19 miles per gallon. Which is is not terrible, oh, um, considering what it is. Yeah, you know, I mean, cons- considering this thing has the aerodynamics of a barn door, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's acceptable. Um, yeah, uh, for me, but, it is not. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, you know, I think if you want, you know, some of the other cool, like you have for this fifty thousand dollar price point. You get things like the locking front and rear differentials. You get, you know, the rear, um, the, yeah, front and rear differential locks. You don't get the trail control or the trailer, t- the trail turn assist. Um, you have to step up to a different package to get that. So that that adds more to the cost if you want those features. And if you're gonna if you're gonna go off roading, I would definitely seriously consider you know getting whatever package has the trail turn assist in there because that is a re- when you're on really tight trails is that is feature. so helpful when they had us try that out when they did the launch of the bronco and i was like okay whatever you you literally feel like you're just pivoting on a dime like you turn yeah. so tight it is unbelievable like you because they have us they have a course a preset trail they know we can make it through so in your head you know that you can make it through and you're like i can make it through that it just looks so tight so when you use that you're like that was not just it wasn't even hard it was super simple and easy so yeah if you really do technical driving if you really go off-road oh my gosh you need that yeah because what it does is when when you enable that and you turn the steering wheel all the way to lock in either direction and and then go um it it basically applies full brakes to the inside rear wheel and locks the inside rear wheel. So the, the, the truck, the, the Bronco just turns around that wheel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's almost like a tank turn uh, works really well. So that's, that's a very handy feature to have. Um, what else? Oh, it, the, you know, the ride quality on this thing, even with the, the Sasquatch package was actually surprisingly good. Uh, you know, nice thing is, you know, <laughs> this time of year, we still got a lot of potholes around here. <laughs> The 35 inch tires, nice tall sidewalls, no danger of popping a tire on a Michigan pop hole, pothole. Which is um, something in Michigan or New Hampshire. Yeah, well, g- given <laughs> given that you know the uh, I've had two flats, you know, in the span of about four months. <laughs> yes. Um. So this, you know, this one worked. This one worked out fine. Um. Uh. So when you're going around corners, um. You know, if you're going around corners a little too quick, you can feel that's it's a little soft. You know, it's not. We're not talking, you know, Mustang handling here, you know, it's, but it's what you would expect from from Wouldn't an off road vehicle. A Bronco that could handle like a Mustang. It's a Bronco when it's off roading. It's a Mustang when it's off. I'm not sure. Car. <laughs> that that would be a tough challenge. Um, but do it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, it's it's fun to drive, um, and uh, you you do have to pay attention when you know visibility out of it is not great. It's better than the the Hummer. But it's still not great because you're up fairly high. You know, you've got f- very horizontal hood that goes straight out. Um, and, you know, it's easy. You know, you got to pay attention. You know, if there's something in front of you or behind you, um, you know, it's it would be very easy for things to get missed back there. Um, yeah. Oh, one other detail that I, that I found particularly annoying on this one. That- because this is a manual transmission, you know, you drive when you drive a manual transmission, which I do. Um, you know, you get used to using the handbrake, the, the parking brake when you park the car to keep it from rolling away. Um, you know, with automatics, the automatic transmission has a parking pole in there that does that. It locks the transmission so it can't roll. Um, this one does not have a traditional manual parking brake. It's an electronic park brake. And the switch for the electronic park brake is underneath the left hand side of the dash. And it's kind of down low. And it's not really visible. You know, if you want to see where it is, you kind of have to reach your head around the steering wheel to see it. Um, and it's it's easy to forget that it's there. Um, and so it, it's a little bit of a pain to use. Um, so I would definitely recommend if you're driving one of these, you know, at the very least, make sure you put it in gear when you park it. Don't leave it parked in neutral so it doesn't roll away. Not fun, yeah. um, but 
Yeah. So that's the that's the Bronco Heritage Edition. I like the Bronco. I just like the look of the Heritage Edition. I think when they yeah. do the Heritage, they don't always call it that. Any kind of sort of throwback car. I, I think that it's nice to see a modern car that's actually designed to look like it's not. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Um, so I believe that in the past week, you also drove uh, a, a sort of SUV-ish type of vehicle that um, maybe was did not leave you quite as happy. Yeah. So, okay. I really wanted it to be good, Sam. I drove the VinFast VF8. So uh, I drove this once before in Vietnam back in September. They flew a whole bunch of us out there, um, but it was a very short drive. They, you know, gave us a tour that included very, very many things in a very brief amount of time in the car, which we knew going out. Um, and at that time, I really kind of felt like, okay, guys, this isn't quite shipping to the U.S. yet. You need to do some work. There were some things that I was like, hmm. This is not ready. And to their credit, they developed this thing really, really, really fast. I think they maybe went a little too fast. So then I thought, okay, now we've got the U.S. first official media drive for this. And they had, I was actually on the wave with a Canadian journalist. So it was the nicest automotive wave I've ever been on in my life. Everyone was very polite. <laughs> um, so they I, say sorry a lot? They did. In fact, one kept saying sorry just to kind of mess with me. I'm like, stop it. Now you're not being a nice Canadian. <laughs> So there is so well, they, were, they were probably saying sorry, you know, in, in place of uh, in place of the VinFast people. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. In place of them. So they had it for us to drive. They had the VF9, which is the next one coming out, which is supposed to be coming out this fall, I think. So there's not even a very long time frame between the VF8, which is actually on the roads today in the U.S. They've delivered 300 units. And I think they said something like 1,500 more are about to be ready to be delivered. So this isn't like a coming soon. This is here. You could see one driving down the road and the VF9 is coming in the fall. So I don't really see. Here's the thing. I hate to just bash a vehicle and sound like I'm bashing a vehicle to be a jerk. I'm not. I want the VinFast to be good. I want them to succeed. Tons of time and energy and man hours and blood and tears go into every vehicle that we ever drive. This one just doesn't quite feel ready. And it's like, if any one of the things that are wrong felt wrong, it'd be okay. But so many things aren't quite there. The fit and finish on the inside isn't there. When I shut the door, the door handle is like the kind of, you know what I'm, you're going to know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think how to verbalize this. The plastic, when you drive something that's pre-production and it's not the finished plastic that you will drive when you have it. And you can just tell when you look at it, it looks a little off. It feels a little. It doesn't thick. have, they don't have the texturing on it. You know, they're, they're using a, a pre-production mold. That's just very smooth, yeah. no texturing, no, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the right color match and things like that. That's what the actual handle is like. And it flexes a little bit when you grab it and goes <laughs> like it squeaks, right? All of them had that same handle. Maybe not all squeaked like mine, but they all had that handle. Um, the leather isn't quite tight enough on the seat. So you see spots where there's sort of a little bit of a buckle, like a little bit of a lump in it. No big deal, right? Yeah. Until you sit in that seat over and over. Now that buckle becomes a crease. And now you have a problem with your leather seats. Um, then, so that was, so the fit and finish things just don't feel quite right. The infotainment screen, which I should have the size in front of me and I don't, but they have a large infotainment screen. There is no instrument cluster. There's just the infotainment screen and it's large. So like the left hand, I'm going to say maybe third of the screen serves as your instrument cluster. So you're glancing over there for your speed and for anything related to your vehicle, which takes a little getting used to. And here's a weird thing. I thought I was having a hard time getting used to shifting my eyes constantly right if I wanted to check things that were there. Cause I, and I thought my sinuses were messed, messed, messed up because I've been flying and it's allergy season. Cause I was getting ever so slightly like the sort of motion sick sensation. I was driving. I don't make myself motion sick when I drive. And I'm like, wow, I just must have like sinus issues until the reviews of this came out. And another journalist said for the first time in his life, he got motion sick. And I was like, Oh wait, <laughs> is it actually the movement of the car? So I didn't peg it to that at the time, but now I'm like, Oh my gosh, was that actually it? Because I only felt that when I was driving it. Um, and that has to do with the suspension system. It's very, it's weirdly sloppy. Like if you if you go over a little hump in the road, like if you think you know you go over a speed bump and you get that like foom, 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 like kind of like bump, 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 it kind of like yeah. sways a little. Well, imagine that just on any kind of little hilly kind of bump in the highway, but it 
in the road, but it goes more like you feel like you're driving a much heavier vehicle for the amount of sway that you get. Say a typical sedan sways once, thunk, thunk, and it's done. This is like thunk, 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 thunk. Like it takes a second for that motion to stop. Like it's severely underdamped. Yes, like it's severely under damp. So you're like, whoa, that's too much motion. Um, same thing left to right. Like when you turn that, that the time it takes for it to resettle, if you do turn to the right, turn to the left, or you know, changing lanes, it takes a little too long. Um, the it's so many things, Sam. The um ADAS, the driver assistant stuff. I don't know what was happening. I was getting error messages that kept popping up. I had a yellow triangle that kept popping up with an exclamation point. I don't know what it was yelling at me. It was just a yellow triangle. It, there was no indication to why it was an angry yellow triangle with an exclamation point. And sometimes it was on and sometimes it was off and sometimes it's blinked. And then there were other messages that came up for like, boom, boom. And I couldn't tell if that was a too quick warning or if it's like not working, no, I'm back. Like, I don't even know what was going on with those systems. Um, it was... And, and then the lane keep assist, I'm going to say it was lane keep assist. So that if like you drift a little to the right, it's too sensitive, like redonkulously. So, so I am driving literally in a straight line, very consciously, like keep this thing as centered as a human can center a vehicle. And if I just ever so slightly move to the right, it wants to correct me and bring me back to the center, but it does it so aggressively that it literally throws me into the other lane of traffic. I couldn't drive this with one hand. I couldn't take one hand off the wheel because it was so aggressive in its corrections. I had to be ready to correct it back and say, nope, I'm in the correct lane. That is oncoming traffic. I would prefer to stay on this side of the road. Um, it was, it's not ready. And a lot of these things are things that can be like over the air updates. You can change how your, these systems work. It's not like necessarily. Well, some, some things, things like, you know, the damping. You can't change that with an over the air update. That has to, you can't change what, the steering feel with an OTA that, update. That's it. But like the, the ADAS stuff, let's say they can fix that with software, right? Engineering man, they could do that. Couldn't they? Could they? To a that? point. Okay. It dep depends on what the hardware is that's on the car. See, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to cut them some slack because <laughs> I don't, I really don't like having a vehicle that there's just a lot that I don't like. And it was this collective even the, you know, how the, and I did, one of the things I did like, so in the infotainment system, when you have it in um, CarPlay, sometimes getting out of CarPlay and getting back into the car's native infotainment, native system is a little bit funky. It doesn't, you have to swipe a screen or two or, you know, to get back. This one, you just check any of the spots. If you touch anything that's like where the instrument cluster is, anything that's sort of like black screen, you know, that's not actively showing something, boom, it takes you right back to the system's native infotainment i'm trying to come up with something don't you do laugh sam um, no I, I mean you know this uh, there's um jalopnik had a piece uh yesterday or the day before um the the headline and this is sort of a summary of you know some of the highlights of the reviews critics agree the vinfast vf8 is very very bad from flaky turn signals to broken ADAS features and a, sus and a suspension that induces nausea, critics are not impressed with VinFast's first electric SUV for America. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that we've we've often talked about, you know, in the cars that that we review, it, and I think over the last several years, I think we've all come to the conclusion that even the quote unquote worst cars mm -hmm. available today, you know, stuff like the Mitsubishi Mirage, yes. are not terrible. You know, they're, they're just, you know, they feel cheap. You know, they're like the, I, I like the, the wrap up on this uh, Jalopnik piece. The real commonality between all these accounts is that overnight, the VF8 has obliterated the notion that there are no terrible cars for sale anymore. I, Frankly, I, it's hard to remember the last time a car released to overwhelming disdain, a car that every critic agreed simply wasn't ready. I, and, and you said this last September when you came back from Vietnam, you know, we were sitting in that hotel room in Montana. I know. And here's the, like, it, it pains me. If you could see the expressions I'm making as I'm talking, it pains me to have to be this hard on a car because I am not the person that hates a car just to hate a car. I don't hate it just because everybody else says it's not good. I don't hate it just to be that a hole that's like, yeah, this car is garbage. You're, you're not just being cranky. It's I'm not. It's a, this is a truly bad car. This is truly not good. And the thing of it is though, Sam, I feel like, like, if they had just taken more time to do it, if they just taken more but, time to do it. When, you know, when we talked about this, when you came back from Vietnam, you know, at that point they were saying, yeah, we're going to, we're going to deliver cars in December. 
This was in September. You said they were going to deliver cars in December. And you, and your response to that was, you know, you should really take another six months. Mm-hmm. You know, give, give it another six months, re- do some refinement on it. And we're now middle of May. Mm-hmm. You know, so almost six months on from when they were originally planning to deliver cars. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like it's gotten notably better. It doesn't. The only thing that I could say was noticeably better. Now, I also have to say, Remember, I drove this for maybe 10 or 15 minutes in Vietnam. It was a really short drive. Mm-hmm. This, this was a proper drive program. We had hours in this car, so we really drove it. So some of this I may not have noticed on a really short drive. It could have been the same or they may have made it better and it's still not great. The one thing I did notice was that the acceleration was better. When I drove it in Vietnam, I felt like it did not accelerate the way that it should have for an electric vehicle. It felt woefully held back. They talked a lot at the time about how the percentage of charge in the battery significantly impacts acceleration because they throttle it down on purpose to preserve battery life. I felt like it accelerated more strongly now than it did then, but it still didn't have quite the pep I expected. Like that was noticeably different to me, positive. That was noticeably different that it accelerated better than it did before. I like how it looks on the outside. Like the styling is kind of fun. I know some people think the front is too busy. I actually like the way this looks. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look, it's not a bad looking car. I, like for me, it looks great. I think the exterior styling is fantastic. I really like what they did on the outside. I really like how it looks. So styling wise, I think it's great. Unfortunately, it's the substance part of it is that you don't have, it just everything feels like it needs to be tweaked a little. You know, I had people, but but, it, but it's okay though because you know this thing gets three hundred and fifty miles and only costs thirty thousand dollars, right? No, no, oh. this thing actually cost fifty thousand uh, dollars. Is the base price on this? And I believe right now you can only lease it, and I think the lease is four hundred and fourteen dollars a month. Um, so this is a that's the other part of it. This is a fifty thousand dollar car. You know what I was saying about the Rivian seventy eight, and it feels like seventy eight. This does not feel like fifty. The thing is, I couldn't I couldn't recommend this even at a lower price because I don't think the ADAS systems work. the The driver assistance systems work well enough to be on the road right now. I wouldn't recommend it for the queasiness that it induces. I wouldn't recommend it for the low power. If those things worked. Let's say for a second, those things worked. I still don't think it feels like a $50,000 car. I think it should be a $30,000 car. It's it's overpriced, even if it's working. There's not enough on the inside to make it feel to command that premium $50,000 price point. Um, but as it stands right now, I couldn't, I could not recommend it. And it kills me to say that because I, I, I've literally never said that about a car before, Sam. I've never driven a car where I thought, I could, if someone was telling me they were considering this right now on May 14th at 1238 PM, I'd be like, don't get it yet. Hold, see if they're able to fix things. See what happens. If you're really set on wanting to drive in fast on wanting to get a new EV from a new automaker who is not just, it's like they've been in Vietnam, but they are new to the U S and you really they haven't even been in Vietnam that long. I mean, I think they, uh, their first cars were like 2017 or 2018. Yeah, it's maybe been five years. So, but at least they've been there five years. Like, <laughs> they're, so they're not brand spanking new. They've had car gas cars in Vietnam since then. But if you really want to give them a shot and you really want to, you really are into this for some reason, just hold a second. Like, if you don't need to buy, hold and see what they do because I just don't feel like this is ready. And I really wish they had done more in the last six months. I don't know what changes were made, but I mean, it was, it was pretty uniformly. Like you said, everybody panned this and it, I'm not lying. It breaks my heart to be this hard in a car. I want to say this is great, but these things are horrible. It looks good. The styling is great. That's about all I can give it. <laughs> and and the range is mediocre. Yeah. You know, the the VF8, uh, according to the, e- the EPA website, the VF8 Eco is rated at 207 miles. The VF8 Plus is only 191 miles. Those aren't good. I mean, you're getting a $50,000 car with those kinds of numbers for range. That's not great. It's not great. And I had, and on my particular wave, there were people that like, I had problems that let me continue driving. There were two journalists, I believe that had problems that didn't allow them to continue driving. So like, it just, it's a hundred ways, not ready. And the people at VinFast, you know, not just the people at the very top of the food chain, who of course, you know, in any company, the guys at the top are going to say, this is an amazing vehicle. We built the next best thing. 
everybody seems to be very vested in making this work. Like you feel like the people are genuinely looking to try and produce a good car. There's a genuine sense of excitement from the people at VinFast and they are very forthcoming. I know there were some criticisms about them not really giving you the full thing. I always felt like any miscommunications I got from VinFast were genuine, honest, like, oh, I thought it was this. She thought it was that. Sorry, this is the answer. Like they will get to you with the information. Sure, and that happens. Right, and that happens. So I have no criticism of how VinFast is handling things, like their PR people, their team, all that top notch. And they're working really hard to get you what you need. But the car is not, it's not ready. And like I said, there's 300 of these that have been delivered in the US already. I, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, more more from you know excerpts from the Jalopnik piece. You know, Scott Evans at Motor Trend says, I may not like the way a turn signal sounds, but I expect it to work every time I use it. One of the VF8s at the launch event couldn't do that. Okay. Similarly, multiple VF8s, including our test vehicle, which had fewer than 1,300 miles on it, had HVAC systems that could only blow cold air when set below 80 degrees and only blow hot air when set above 80 but never warm or cool air, regardless of whether automatic or manual climate was selected. And see, these are things, and the thing that's baffling about this, Sam, Sam, like we've been doing this for a long time. You and I have driven a mm-hmm. lot of cars. Every now and then we'll get in a car at a launch program and we're all like, what the heck happened? Why is this working? And Toyota or Lexus or Ford, whoever's like, what the heck? And there was a software issue and somehow we've all discovered it or there's an issue we've all discovered and they address it. Like, yeah. you know, like you don't know why that's doing that. You see panicked engineers taking notes and it's like, oh, crud. And they fix it. Imagine this times a thousand. <laughs> like, <laughs> so many things. I don't know how. I and mean, it's already shipping. I mean, it's not even like ship, finish it before it ships. It is shipped like this. We have sent it this way. Uh, there are people driving these this way. Yeah. yeah. Ba- based on what you described with the uh, the lane keep assist, you know, it's. Uh, it, sounds like it's not even safe to drive. I I I I hesitate to say that something's unsafe because I feel like that's a really strong judgment, but that lane keep assist made me nervous. It made me nervous because you know, you, you drive it you don't clutch the steering wheel for dear life with a white knuckled grip just driving casually on the highway in California. You got your hands on the wheel and you're paying attention. But this was it was hard enough and jerky enough that I would not take my other hand off the wheel at all. Like, yeah. I, and when I had to take my hand off, I was holding really tightly because it is an aggressive, it's very aggressive and that's not safe. It was, and it wasn't, it also wasn't that I had drifted. It was, I started thinking like, what is wrong? And if I just get really, even just close to the lane, the edge of the lane, I don't even have to drift out of it. Like over the, it's, it's like, wham, you're, you're drifting out. It's like, no, I'm not. And I would still prefer to stay on my side of the road. <laughs> So yeah, I, I just, I I can't recommend it. I really hope VinFast figures it out. That's sort of the caveat to it all. I'm not hating. I don't hate. I'm not hating on the company. I'm hating on the fact that the product they made could be better. And they, if they gave it more time, they could be ready. And I, I want them to figure it out. I would like to see them make some changes. I'd like to see them make some changes fast because if they don't, I don't, I don't know where this goes from here. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Sam? Can they can they overcome the scathing reviews that you just read off? Well, I mean, do you remember when Hyundai started in the United States? Yes. They had a really, really rough start. You know, their quality was terrible. Now, granted, you know, the uh, at that time the cars were a lot simpler than they are today. Um, and you know, they were they were able to overcome that. It took a while. It took them some a few years and you know, they eventually had to, you know, resort to doing 10 year warranties, you know, to demonstrate that they were going to stand behind these things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're very successful now. You know, they're, I think, they're fifth, fifth, fifth largest automaker in the world. But, you know, they still have it's even after what year was Hyundai introduced? Do you know what year? However many. Uh, years? I think they launched the the original Sonata in the U.S. in 86 or 87, the Sonata and the Accent. So it's a long number of years. But- yeah. And there's still people who, you know, don't think highly of Hyundai. Yeah, Like I think very highly of Hyundai and Kia. I think their cars are great. I, I have no hesitation recommending. As long as you get one with a push button start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, I, I have no problem recommending those to people. No reservations recommending those as a car. People are looking for cars and that's one of the ones I'll rattle off whatever segment it is that they're shopping. 
But sometimes when I say that still, there are more than a few people that are like, wait, you're, those are, those are garbage. Those are junk. And I'm like, well, not anymore. They've been quite good for quite some time. 1986, it's 2023. And people are still trying to shake the notion that Hyundai builds garbage cars. They don't, they build great cars. They truly, truly do. But there's a lot of people who don't believe it. Can VinFast pull off the same thing, a really rough start, fix it and have people say in, because they they can't go that long, you know, like however many years, wait, they fixed it. They've changed it. Like the PR effort that's going to be required to overcome this, like that VF9 had best be a gift from God if they are expecting people to buy into VinFast. There have to be big changes for that one. I'm hoping they can do it. I genuinely hope they can do it. Um, all right, let's move on from VinFast. Okay. Um, you also drove, I believe, the GMC Canyon. I did. What did you think was, of that? GMC Canyon. Hey, that was that actually everything worked. All the things worked. <laughs> turn signals and everything. Turn signals worked. No nausea. Worked. I didn't get sick. Um, did all the off-roady things it was supposed to do off-road. Like, woohoo! It worked. <laughs> um, I was really excited. Everything worked. Um, so that, and in fact, I see the link that you put in. I just realized the link that you put in. Did you put that link in there? I did. You did. So um, I st- have a, another podcast that I started just for myself for kicks and giggles and fun that my husband is my cohort on called The Road Reflected. And I just realized you use my link in your, the show notes because um, I talked about it in there. Um, and you can hear me talk about it more on The Road Reflected with my husband. Um, but I liked the canyon. I thought the canyon was really good. They came out with a new AT4X, which is the more off-roady version there's the AT4. Now there's AT4X. So you've gone up one. Did you drive this one too, Sam? Uh, no, I did not go on this one. You did not try the one. So they had us take this on some pretty gnarly um, roads off-road in Asheville, genuinely needing to use all the off-road features that this comes with. So not just a dirt road, like through a... No, not just a dirt road. state. Through an estate. Sorry, Hyundai. Um, not <laughs> just a dirt road through an estate. This was actually, you needed to be able to drive and the, you needed off-road capability. In fact, there was a section they had us do that if you look online, you'll see a million videos because I think we all videoed it because it was just so stinking cool. We went into this. It was very steep. It was a short spot, but it was steep into like a mud pit, mud and water that went sploosh when you came up. And it was When you went down, it was like the guy goes, he demonstrates I'm the pro and I'm first in line to go behind the pro with everybody sitting there with their cameras. I'm like, oh, please, Nicole, don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. As everybody has their camera. I'm like, don't get stuck. I did not. Um, But I watched him go through and when he came to the window and he said, how, how, you know, are are you okay? You got it, Jeannie? And I said, so basically watching you, it looks like you crept down really slowly until it kind of touches the bottom and then you just sent it. He's like, pretty much like, okay, I can do that. (laughs) So it's exactly what you do. And it just went right through. Um, And it wasn't like it was, this was that really, it was just mud and water, like that sludgy, slushy stuff that is mud. Um, So very slick. And it had no problem. Every single vehicle in the lineup, everybody got through, no one got stuck. And the thing of it was, it wasn't like everybody there was an expert off-roader or an expert driver in trucks. There were varying levels based on the people I know who are with me who had some expertise going off-road, who had some expertise in trucks and others who are like, oh God, I've never done anything like this in my entire life ever. Still came right through, which is actually the biggest testament to the vehicle doing what it's supposed to do. If you know how to do it and you do it, big deal. If you don't know how to do it and you still get through, that's a big deal. Um, And so I felt it did it, no problem. Um, I came out with only mud, a mild amount of mud on myself uh, after having to tromp through and take pictures. Uh, I got stabbed by a pricker bush. That was not fun. Um, Although the GMC guy was like hacking away at everything to get us through. Like he was like going through a, with like a machete through the forest using his arms. So it was really, it was lots of stuff. There was, you know, lots of terrain. Um, It was very fun. They also let us play around with the Baja mode, um, which is sort of like the high speed driving. There was only a teeny little section where we could really open up because this isn't like the desert. But when you open up that Baja mode's fantastic. It was great. So I liked it. I like what they did on the inside. It still has a sort of premium GMC look and feel, uh, which is nice. It has a really large infotainment screen that's standard. So there's no weedy little tiny screen and having to move up a trim. The whole lineup has a large infotainment screen, which is nice. Uh, so I, I, you know, thumbs up. I like the GMC Canyon. I think that was a good offering. And I think for people looking for a mid-sized truck, whether you want the super capable AT4X or their fancy pants Denali, 
it's it's a good choice. Cool. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting this year. Um, you know, with the new canyon, they and the Colorado, the Chevy Colorado, which is you know basically the same vehicle, that they've decided to narrow down the the scope. Uh, the the body styles to just one. So now there's only a crew cab. There's no more, you know, extended cab, you know, traditional cab style version of it. Um, and they've also gone with just one engine this time. You only, there's only the 2.7 liter four cylinder turbo uh, that is the base engine in the, in the big trucks. Um, but uh, what, you know, how, how was that engine? I think it was good, you know, that, and that was a big complaint or I guess a big concern for people. Like I can't get this configured as many ways as I want. And people tend to like to configure their truck in 85,000 different variations. But again, this is not a full size truck. This is a mid size truck. So slightly different person who's probably not doing the same level of towing or like work on the ranch that someone who gets a full size vehicle. I felt like that powertrain was great. It had no problems. We were going on, we did the off-road section, but to get to it, there were just twisting highway roads through the sort of mountainy area outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And it had no problem going up and down those. Like you could really hit the gas and it would accelerate a little bit on the noisy side. Like you hear it, but again, this is a truck. This isn't a sedan. So you always kind of hear the acceleration. You hear it working a little bit more in a truck, but it wasn't intrusive. It accelerated just fine. Um, and I think as far as the utility of that bed, if you need a really, if you want, you know, if you want more, well, then you're going to have to move away from this, but it still has decent towing numbers. It still has decent payload as a mid-sized truck. I think you have to sort of qualify it mid-sized truck, not full-size truck. And as a mid-sized truck, the power is fine. The handling is great. Everything is good. You're not going to have the same kind of Towing and payload is the big guys. If you really need that, since there's not other configurations, you mean that's what the big guys are for. That's what the big guys are for. So as they midsize, it does a beautiful job. Okay. Well, it's not the only mid new midsize truck launching this year. In fact, <laughs> there's a whole fleet of midsize new midsize trucks <laughs> launching this year. Um, and uh, I think when we're in Hawaii next week, uh, we're going to see another one, uh, the new Toyota Tacoma. Um, but before that. Um, last week, Ford, um, or I guess actually, yeah, last week, um, Ford um, showed off the uh, 2024 Ford Ranger and Ranger Raptor um, for the North American market. So we actually first saw the new Ranger. So this is the sixth generation Ranger. Um, and we first saw this one in late 2021. That's when they first released images of it and said, yep, this is coming. Um, you know, it was delayed a little bit because of all the um, all the supply chain issues and everything else. Um, it's already launched in Europe and some other parts of the world. Um, and uh, uh, it's also going to form the basis for the new VW Amarok pickup truck, the new generation version of that that's going to be sold outside of North America. But now we're finally getting it here in North America. Um, and so with um, the previous generation Ranger back in 2011, when they launched the, the, the fifth gen Ranger, um, that's when they made the shift from a compact to a midsize truck for the Ranger. And at that point, Ford decided, yeah, you know, we don't really need the Ranger in North America anymore. Um, you know, cause it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't cost that much less to make it than it, than to build uh, an F series pickup. Um, and, you know, it's not really getting better fuel economy than the F series pickup. So, you know, we're just going to go with the F series from now on. Uh, and, you know, so they sold, they built the Ranger for the rest of the world and, and we didn't get it here until 2019. By 2019, you know, the F series had continued moving more and more up market. They kept introducing these premium trim levels and selling more and more of those. And the average transaction price of, of an F 150 was getting up to around $50,000. And so they decided, okay, we need something more affordable in here. And so they brought the the global Ford Ranger back to North America for four years ago. Um, and they, they did some mild updates on it, but it was basically the same as the one they'd sold overseas. And, you know, it was fine. You know, it was a, it was good size. Um, you know, the interior, you know, was sturdy, but not particularly premium feeling, especially if you got the Lariat. If you went for an XL or an XLT, it was fine. You know, it was hard because it was all hard plastics and, stuff like that. 
And, you know, they were a little more affordable. If you went for a Lariat, and when I first drove one back in 19, mm-hmm. you know, I drove a, a Lariat that at the time was like $43,000. And I said, you know, it's a nice truck, but it's not worth, it doesn't feel like it's worth 43 grand, you know, for 10 grand less, you could get an XLT that would, I think would be a lot better option. Um, this new Ranger now, definitely, as you talked about with the Rivian, it feels more premium. You know, the materials are much nice, much nicer than the the outgoing version. The overall size of the Ranger, the overall length is the the same. It's like within, I think it's like a tenth of an inch longer or something than the compared to the old Ranger. But it has two inches more wheelbase, and it's also two inches wider than before, hmm. um, and it's a couple inches taller. So you know, it it you look at it, it looks a little bigger feels a little bigger than before even though it's the same overall length does it look that way when you see it in person could you yeah tell? yeah yeah it, it does it you know it and the the design you know the previous ranger was a little more rounded looking you know it kind of you know almost felt like more of a throwback to the late 90s early 2000s f-150s if you remember those they were more rounded looking before they went to the more squared off the des- squared off design um and um, you know, so the, the Ranger had a little more rounded look. This one adopts the same kind of design language that we see on the F series, you know, more squared off, chunky looking, um, as well as even on the Maverick, you know, and, and, you know, since they, since the Ranger came out, they also brought out the Maverick at an even lower price. And so, you know, now you've got these three distinct levels in there and, you know, so you've got, you know, in the headlights, you know, they've got the signature C clamp signature lighting in the headlights and you know the front end looks a little more like a like a modern f-150 um you know the sides are a little more sculpted than before uh you know it looks a little more modern it's a it's a it's a good looking truck um like the canyon in colorado um it's crew cab only no more extended cab version in it you know i always felt those those extended cab versions you know they had rear jump seats in there that were basically useless it's like it's like we're, we're giving you this extended cab because we feel like we should have that option yeah but but nobody was buying them so they said okay fine we'll just do the crew cab because that's what everybody wants anyway mm-hmm. um and um so this time part of um the the uh the new pl- the platform is a heavily upgraded version of what they had before which is basically the same platform that's under the bronco um, and so a big change was the, the front part of the frame, it's now hydroform. So it's wider. So there's more space for engines in there than before. So that's part of why it's two inches wider. Mm-hmm. Um, so whereas GM has gone from four cylinder and V6 options to just four cylinders, Ford's gone the other way. And they, now they have the 2.3 liter four cylinder and the 2.7 liter V6. Uh, so the same engine options that are in the Bronco. Um, uh, but no manual transmission option in the Ranger. Um, and then, uh, the, uh, there's also for the first time in North America, the Ranger Raptor, uh, which is, you know, the more, the, the more off-road oriented version, um, you know, joining the F-150 Raptor and the Bronco Raptor, um, higher performance, got the same four liter or three liter, 405 horsepower V6 that's in the uh, Bronco Raptor, um, Fox shocks, but it's not quite as aggressive as the Bronco Raptor. So whereas the Bronco Raptors goes up to 37 inch tires, there's only 33s on the Ranger Raptor. Um, you know, the suspension, you know, is beefed up. It's three, uh, the Ranger Raptor is three and a half inches wider than the standard Ranger um, with wider fenders and everything and wider track, different suspension. But again, not quite as aggressive as the as the Bronco Raptor, um, and um, you know the the Bronco, uh, you know, because the shorter overhangs of the SUV versus the pickup truck, you know, it's going to have a little more off road capability there as well. Um, the um, the Ranger and and Ranger Raptor uh, go into production this summer and should be available for sale late summer. Uh, we don't have pricing information yet. Um, but uh, you know, so 275 horsepower with the four cylinder, 315 with the uh, with the the two point seven liter, 
Um, and, um, you know, it's got some of the, you know, they brought in some of the the neat features that they have on the F-150, like on the tailgate. Um, you have the the molded in uh, ruler and the tailgate and the molded in cup holders and stuff. And stuff the, like and that. The, That's just nice little handy feature. Yeah. And and the the pockets in the top of the top edge of the tailgate for C clamps, so you can clamp your your stuff down there that you're working on. Um, this they they have um, the uh, bed step um, behind the rear wheels, um, similar to what uh, GMs had for a while, um, and but it's wider than the one like the the GM trucks have the bumper step that you can step up to get into the bed. Um, Ford has it in the, in the side of the bed. So it's wider than the bumper step. So you can actually stand on there with two feet rather than just one feet. It's a little more stable. It'll hold up to 300 pounds. Um, and with that extra width, that two inches of extra width, um, you can also, uh, put in, um, four foot wide sheets of plywood or drywall or whatever you want in between the wheel wells. And it sits flat on the, the floor bed. Uh, unlike in the uh, the Maverick, which is narrower, where you have to sit up, sit them on top of the wheel wells, and then the Maverick has you can open up the the uh, tailgate to two different levels, so you can have if if you have it halfway open um, with the, the the straps on there, then a sheet will lay flat across the the edge of the uh, tailgate and the um, and the wheel wells. Um, so you know it it's a I think. You know, it looks good. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a very interesting competition uh, in the midsize truck segment with um, the GM trucks, the rank, the new Rangers, the, the all new Tacoma. We got the new Frontier what, was it last year or the year before. Um, and, you know, there's a good probability that we will see something from Ram in the next year or so as well. Uh, so getting to be a very hot segment. I think it's neat. I like to see them continue to move that segment forward because it was a little bit ignored for a while. And I think it's a lot of people want a truck, but they don't want an F-150. Like, yeah. They don't want a 1500. You know, they need something a little smaller. You still kind of, it's like why crossovers are so cool. You don't want a full size SUV, but you want a little bit of crossover versatility. You don't want a full size truck, but you want a little bit of truck versatility. So I think it's good. And I liked, I like the Ranger. I'm excited to see what this one looks like in person. I'm curious to see how much the bigger size and bigger bits make it feel like uh, more truck. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it looks a little more trucky than before. Yeah. Um, so that's good. All right. Um, Honda, um, they uh, recently ended production of the NSX. It's been what? 13 years to 14 years since they ended production of the S 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently they may be planning um, a new sports car coming out this year to celebrate Honda's 75th anniversary. That's um, kind of exciting because Honda builds nice, fancy sports cars. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and the and the render that they, um, you know, this is a story from Autocar. The render that they have here, you know, shows a front end that looks very much like the NSX, you know, but it's a front engine, rear drive, you know, long hood, you know, roadster rather than, you know, the mid-engine um, supercar that the NSX was. Um, and, you know, presumably if they do this, you know, it's going to use the two liter turbo from the Civic Type R and the Integra Type S. Um, you know, I I don't know about you, but I would love to have uh, a, a, something like this coming from Honda. It would be great to see what they could do with that engine in a in, in a rear wheel drive sports car. Yeah, I think this could be fun. And where it's like an anniversary vehicle, you're to celebrate anniversary. They tend to do fun stuff with that. They're not going to mess around. Like the 75th anniversary celebration never is just a meh vehicle or the 50th. It's not just like, yeah, we made a fit. They're going to make something cool. Yeah. But like because of Honda, you know, they, it's so, Honda's such a, a, an interesting company because they make like the Accord, which is just like a solid sedan. And the CRV, which is just a solid little crossover. And then they make fun stuff, you know? And I like when they do the fun stuff, it's like underneath these mild mannered cars that everyone's buying, there's some actual personality that they save for the sporty stuff. I'm hoping this, this is all the personality, all the fun, all the excitement, all the engagement that I know Honda can do, but you don't generally, you don't see in sort of the everyday Honda. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you, you see it in stuff like the NSX, like the, the Civic Type R. 
um, and the Integra, but uh, yeah, it certainly doesn't make it into the the mainstream products. Right. So it's nice to, th- I, that's why I'm, I have high hopes for this because I know they can build some really fun stuff and I bet this is going to be fun. All right. One more item before we get to a couple of listener uh, emails. Um, the Polestar 3 uh, and the Volvo EX90, a uh, pair of electric vehicles, electric crossovers uh, built on a new electric only platform um, that were due to launch this year have been delayed. Wow. Um, they've been pushed back into uh, 20, or first half of 2024. I actually went to, there's a new Polestar store here in Detroit. Uh, actually in Royal Oak. I uh, went over there on Friday. Um, they had the Polestar 3. They're doing a little tour of some of the Polestar dealers uh, around the country, taking the uh, the three around to to these. And so I went over there and uh, as I walked in, um, Stephanie Brindley was in there chatting with uh, with Mike O'Fiara. And yep. so that was fun. Uh, we were checking it out and we were, we were talking about this. Um, and they put out, an, they had put out an announcement the day before on Thursday as part of uh, Polestar's uh, first quarter financial results, that um, production, which was supposed to start late this summer, has been pushed back to Q1 of next year, of 2024. Um, and then uh, for the, and that's going to be uh, first in China. Uh, and then they're going to add production at the, um, um, the Volvo plant in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and then that, uh, that plant is also going to build the EX90. Uh, so we will get the the currently scheduled to get the Polestar 3 on sale here in the second quarter of next year. So about just about a year from now mm-hmm. is what Mike told us. Um, and uh, the EX90 should be coming out around the same time. Um, and the reason for this, software. Mm-hmm. They, uh, Volvo's having some challenges with developing the software. Um, and it seems like everybody's having software issues right now. Um, you know, VW's Cariad division, which is their their software division, is um, they just they made an announcement earlier this week that they had fired the CEO, the CTO, and the CFO, um, and you know this, uh, and they were replacing all of them. They brought in the um, head of manufacturing from Bentley to run Cariad. Wow. Um, and they're going to have other uh, new leaders uh, joining him uh, soon. Um, this, you know, everybody's having issues trying to develop this complex new software. But, you know, I give here's looping back to our Vinfest thing, but I give them credit. They said, we're not ready. The yeah. software isn't ready. We're not ready. We got to push this out. It's going to affect our deliveries for the year. It's going to affect everything for the year. We're going to ask the people who were not doing what we felt like they should have been doing. But they said, we can't, we cannot deliver this this way. I give them full credit for saying we are not ready rather than like, well, let's just push it through and see what happens. I mean, this is how, this is, this is how it should be done. If you're not ready, don't put the car out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Get it, you know, get it better <laughs> yeah it, it's got for for a vehicle especially something that you know is going to start at eighty thousand right. dollars you know the the standard for what cons- consumers expect today i think is a lot higher than what it used to be yeah. and you know especially when you're talking about software there's so many things that can go wrong with that you know just take the extra time and get it you know to a point where it's at least stable and you know, works reasonably well before, uh, before you ship it. Right. So it's a bummer, but kudos to them for saying, nope, we can't ship this like it is. We got to hold. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's, uh, do a couple of listener, uh, feedback things. Uh, let's start off with Eric S. Um, Eric, uh, wrote to us at feedback at wheelbearings.media, which is where you can all reach us. Um, I'm writing, uh, to the email from this week's show, uh, referring to last week's show, complaining about how long it takes Nicole to come up with her weekly publication. Nicole, ignore everything that person said. The fact that someone was annoyed enough by your intros that they felt the need to scold you about it is nutty. It blew my mind so much that I'm writing my first ever email to a podcast. I listen to your podcast for variety. Not every car is a supercar, 
of car reviews uh, to hear things explained from an engineer. And yes, your fun, unpolished, <laughs> organized banter. Uh, I'm sure there is an NPR style podcast out there where the hosts are clearly reading directly from a script that can uh, that, that a person can find. If there isn't, maybe there is a reason. <laughs> keep keep being you and doing what you've been doing and ignore every email, except maybe this one. <laughs> Eric S., I'm not going to ignore your email. You're my favorite listener ever. <laughs> Everybody else come up with a cool email to send me and you'll move to the top of the list. <laughs> and it was really sweet. I thought it was funny that someone was so bent out of shape about that. That's fine. <laughs> um, and I appreciate the support, Eric. I'll just keep being me and everyone's going to have to suffer through. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is, let's see, let me get this going here, uh, is actually a, an audio message that we got from uh, Adam Jackowenko, who has written to us before. Um, and uh, uh, we, I think we talked, I think he sent us an email a couple of weeks ago about uh, the Cadillac Lyric and his parents trying to buy a Cadillac Lyric. And so he's got some feedback for that. So here, let's play that. Hey, Wheelbanks crew, this is Adam in San Diego, and I just wanted to give some feedback on the Cadillac Lyric since the listener uh, last episode was asking about the noise cancellation. Uh, and during that process, I also wanted to give some feedback about the car uh, itself because my parents ordered one on day one of ordering and they just got their debut edition this week. Uh, and I went to their house to help them. Uh, I went to pick up the car with them and I helped get the car home and help them set up the car. And I, I have some thoughts as well on that. So I think some people might find interesting. Uh, as far as the uh, noise cancellation goes, I think it's fine. It sounds really nice in the interior. It's pretty quiet. It's kind of what you'd expect for a Cadillac. Uh, I don't notice the noise cancellation at all because it's passive. Um, I don't notice the tires, road noise or anything like that. Uh, so I don't think there'd be any concerns with that. And I think it's pretty much a nice, comfy, uh, cushy ride. Uh, as far as the experience of getting the Cadillac goes, I wanted to share that we went to the dealership. Um, I went with my parents and uh, the car was filthy when we arrived, even though the salesperson said, it's here, come get it. Um, they weren't ready at all for us. Uh, once we finally got in to sign the paperwork, they tried to add on a $5,000 cash markup, as well as $3,000 in additional dealer add-ons, including a tracking system uh, for a car that has OnStar, mind you, uh, an alarm system for a car that comes with an alarm, um, and VIN etching and paint protection. And so my parents are in their 70s, they're retired, they were excited to get a Cadillac, but the whole experience really soured them on the brand, on the experience, on the dealership. Uh, I spent three hours negotiating all of those things down uh, and away for them. Uh, so that was a pretty pretty poor experience overall. Not, not surprising there since um, a lot of dealers do that these days. So that was unfortunate. And then when we got the car home, I spent the better part of the afternoon as well as the whole following day uh, giving them uh, advice on how to use the car, set up the car. I don't think this car is for the technology faint of heart. Um, it may be a little challenging for some uh, Cadillac demographic buyers, if you will, um, who may not be entirely tech savvy. Um, that's not to say all of them aren't, but it's tough. It's a lot of in infotainment functionality. My parents are pretty tech savvy um, and they were struggling with just you know, things like setting up the garage door opener um, because it's not really um, intuitive how you do it and then actually using the garage door opener is similar to the um, glove box functionality there's no hard buttons for either uh, which was very frustrating to them because uh, they've never experienced that in any car in their life um, so you have to um, hit the uh, screen for opening the glove box as well as opening the garage door once it's um, tied into the car uh, in fact by default you have to swipe on the screen and then tap on the screen twice just to open the garage door um, if you're tech savvy enough to figure out that you can make a shortcut, it can do it in little as two taps on the screen, but that's the least amount of taps you can do to open your garage door. And if the car is in anything but uh, where the infotainment screen is on, then you can't do it. Like if it's in reverse uh, or if you don't have you know the right um, screen up on the infotainment, you actually can't open the garage door at all. Um, so that's <laughs> pretty odd and frustrating. Um, also something I noticed, uh, the back seats have a large plastic base to them um, at the bottom of your back and the top of your butt where your, kind of the, your butt goes. Um, it's very uncomfortable. None of us actually like sitting in the back seat because of the large plastic trim that went across where your butt is. It kind of hurt our all of our butts sitting in the back seat. So that was kind of weird for a car that should be pretty comfortable in all seats. Um, 
But one thing I will say was pretty cool is it has like um, a little piggy bank, as they call it, feature. It's like an Easter egg for um, the belt buckles for the back seat. So you actually, if you look for it, if you if you can see it, if you can, uh, when you before you fold the back seats down, um, you can put the buckles in this little. Um, uh, de de repository sort of place where they hold a place so that they don't uh, the belts uh, don't get hung up on the seats when they fold down. It's a really cool feature. I'm surprised no car that I've seen has ever done that before. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to give that overall feedback on the uh, the lyric and the, the purchasing experience and some of the the quirks that I I noticed about it. So thanks, love the show. Bye. Thank you so much for sending hey, that. Um, this is oh, Adam. Oh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> there we go. Well, he has the single most soothing voice I've ever listened to in my entire life. Like, he does. Oh, that's really calming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was really interesting feedback, especially the number of things that they Vin etching and all the stuff that they tried to tech. Come on, dealers, stop. This, this is why this is why people hate dealers. Exactly why people hate dealers. But I think it was neat that he addressed the the sound and also the, the, the how tech forward this car is that can be a challenge for anyone mm -hmm. even if you are tech savvy but as he said this sort of the demographic buying a cadillac that might be a bigger challenge and you know generally speaking the older you are the less tech savvy you are with the newest and latest and greatest it's just the way that it works people i love all the older folks out there who don't like tech that's fine but it does pose a problem that if you don't have someone who can help you with some of that stuff you're going to find yourself going back to the dealership or you're going to be taking your parents back to the dealership or spending time sitting in the driveway like Adam just did. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, um, the garage door opener, um, you know, most, uh, most modern vehicles uh, have, you know, the home link system uh, built in there where, you know, you'll find three buttons up by the headliner there where you can program it to open your garage door. So you don't have to have the, the, the garage door opener clipped on your, on your visor or anything like that. Um, and, Cadillac has put that into the touchscreen interface, which, you know, again, if it would be one thing if you, you know, if it was always visible on the top layer of the screen, you know, the interface, but, you know, if it's buried down there somewhere, a couple steps down, you know, that's not great. Um, it, it's, you know, that's really unfortunate. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I think, um, I mean, I've only had the one opportunity to drive the Lyric at the drive program last June in Park City um, and didn't really spend any notable amount of time in the back seat. Have you had a chance? You haven't had a chance to spend more time with the Lyric, have you? I haven't spent a lot of time with it. No, I haven't had it for a lengthy amount of time. So I had a very short time and it was just driving. I didn't even get a chance to sit in the back seat because we had such narrow little windows while we were driving it. Um, but that's interesting. Now I'm really curious to to see what he's talking about in the backseat. To see, well, <laughs> like Cadillac Lyric, it hurt our butts. That's not really what Cadillac's probably looking for. <laughs> no, hopefully we'll we'll have more of a chance soon. Because um, there was a question uh, a couple of weeks back uh, that we were waiting for a response from from GM on as far as you know the ramp up of the the Lyric production. Um, and during their um, their Q1 earnings call. They did. Uh, they did say that you know their plan. They I think they built two thousand lyrics so far through the end of March, um, in total, which is not a whole lot. But um, in Q two, they're expecting to significantly ramp up the production rate on those vehicles um, as they they were getting waiting to get more batteries from their Lordstown battery plant. Um, so hopefully by the end of this quarter, you know, we, we should start seeing a lot more of them coming out. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to spend more time with one, uh, in the not too distant future. Yes, I agree. I'd like to drive one for more than the brief time I had. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Adam. And, uh, if anybody else wants to record, uh, something for us and send it in that we can include in the show, uh, you can, uh, record that and, you know, put it in a Dropbox or OneDrive or whatever, send us a link, or if it's, you know, if the file is not too large, you can just, um, attach it to the email, uh, and send it to feedback at wheelbearings.media and we will definitely include it. All right. Anything else, uh, you want to talk about this week? I feel like that's it. I feel like we had a good chat, even without Robbie. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And um, next week, um, we're going to take the week off because uh, it's my wedding anniversary. And uh, 
I'm going to be enjoying it uh, on a beach somewhere in the middle of the Pacific with my wife. That's fantastic. Everyone needs to get away. And so we're going to give Robbie and Nicole the week off as well. But there will be a show, um, you know, uh, with all of the interviews that we did at the New York Auto Show this year. Um, most, Some of those have been posted previously on the Patreon feed. So if you're a Patreon supporter, you may have heard some of them. But there's also some new stuff in there. And for all the rest of you. Um, there's going to be, I think, six interviews on there uh, with people from um, Hyundai, from Stellantis, uh, from Ford, um, and um, and from Kia. Uh, so uh, look for that uh, at the usual time. Uh, it'll be coming out uh, next Sunday. Um, and we will talk to you again in two weeks' time. Bye. Bye.